Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Shift Church. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. You can scan this QR code, fill out the Connect card, and we'll send you a free Starbucks gift card this week. This week is the PFLAG Family Support Group. It meets this Tuesday at 7 p.m. at the Pride Center. It's about an hour and we let the conversation go where it goes. It's an awesome time of support and community. For more information, see the attendant at the welcome desk. Next week, Dr. Hannah Bain will be wrapping up our Upside Down Kingdom series. Listen, you know I have to hear my dad talk all the time, so I'm super excited to hear someone else. You don't wanna miss her unique perspective on how Jesus teaches us to lead. July 3rd is our next online only service. Celebrate our freedom with friends and family and enjoy, I didn't read this before, so I need to read this so I know how to say it. July 3rd is our next online only service. Enjoy the three day weekend with your friends and family. Our services will stream live at 10.30 a.m. on YouTube and Facebook. Sign up for our shift serve day at the YMCA. It's Sunday, July 31st from 10 to noon. You can scan the QR code to register. They have projects for all skill levels, so even your kids can help and be a part. That's all the announcements that I have for this week. So let's check out this sweet Father's Day video. Haha, <laughs> this is dad life. It's how we live 24 seven, 365. Check me. Gas station glasses, don't care what the masses Think about me with my sweet goatee I'm rocking my Dockers with a cuff and a crease I got that St. John's Bay and the clip for my piece I look nice, I got dozens of dollars and that's right It goes straight to my daughters and my wife I'm a miracle dad, making magic with the checkbook Is the talent I have, I roll hard in the yard with a 60 inch cut Zero turn radius, my neighbors say, what? They be driving by, peeping my landscape. Yo, these greens got nothing on my manscape. Hydrangeas, what? begonias, no. crepe myrtles, Stop. ornamental turtle. Hold up, is that a weed in my fescue? Oh no, round up to the rescue. It's the dead life, it's the dead life. Take my daughter to the party. It's the dead life. It's the dead life. It's the dead life. Shooting vids of the kids. It's the dead life. Roll up to the splash pad. 10 a.m. My whole entourage hops out the minivan. We splishy splashy for an hour or two. Then it's back to the house. Yeah. Prepping for the barbecue. Brats, dogs, racker ribs, whatever. Get me on the Weber, man, nobody does it better. Call me Lord of the Grill. I'm king of the coals. Nana secret recipe, you know how I roll. 1080p, 16 by 9. I'm rocking man cave status with a screen like mine. Keep your peanut butter hands off my 50 inch Vizio. Pop up the corn, roll the Disney video. We got Aladdin, Jasmine, Abu, the genie. Hey. With kids like mine, everybody wants to be me. Sing a night song and then it's off to bed. This is the dad life, no more to be said. It's the dad life, hey. it's the dad life. Oh. Hit the mall, coaching ball. It's the dad life, it's the dad life, hey. it's the dad life. Oh. Playing rough, fixing stuff. It's the dad life, it's the dad life, it's the dad life. Yeah, you know how we do it, it's the dad life! We had some technical difficulties this morning, and so uh, re-recording this, but we want to wish everybody, um, for all of you dads out there, we want to say Happy Father's Day. For all of you that are stepping into dad roles, Happy Father's Day. Um, we also know that today is a day of celebration for some. And for others, it's a time of remembrance and uh, perhaps mourning. And so we want to uh, recognize uh, all of you in those spaces and praying that um, today is exactly what you need for wherever you are in life. Um, you know, I, I have always hated bullies. Uh, the idea of the um, strong overpowering the weak. And I know from my personal life, I know that that is rooted in my sixth grade year, I experienced relentless bullying uh, 
in sixth grade. And, um, but I also witnessed a ton of it, but there's one, one time that, that stands out above everything, even, even over my own bullying. Um, it, as a matter of fact, it stands out so much. I can remember where I was. I, I was in Mrs. Clayton's math class and it was before classes started. So she was out in the hallway and we were being dumb, kind of taking advantage of the fact that she wasn't in the classroom yet. And, um, you know, just sitting around talking stuff. And I was sitting next to a, a young a young boy by the name of Michael. Now, Michael had a diverse ability, and part of that was just the sweetest disposition. He was incredibly kind, uh, the kind of kid that wouldn't hurt a fly, you know what I mean? And um, he was just a sweet kid. Anyway, uh, we're sitting there talking, and in through the classroom, you see this other, this movement, and it's this other boy named Billy. Um, he was he was a jerk. And Billy comes into the classroom, walks up to Michael, doesn't say a word, but walks up to Michael and just full on hits him. And Michael just crumples to the ground and it just lets out this wail that I'll never forget. Um, I had multiple encounters with Billy uh, through middle school and um, I, I always stood up to him. I won some. I lost some, but I won enough to make him think twice. But that idea of, of, of you know, the strong bullying the weak has always just torqued me off. And it started right there. Um, hang on to that for a second. We're in week three of a series that we've called uh, Upside Down Kingdom. And in it, we're looking at these stories of Jesus encounters, uh, encountering different people and how his upside down um his upside down kingdom, how it affects us, and then how it in turn should affect those around us. And last week we we found we looked at a couple of stories found in Luke's account of Jesus's life in, in chapter fifteen. And in Luke chapter fifteen, we see uh, three different lost things, and we find three different people looking for those lost things. And when those lost things are found, that instead of like condemnation or punishment or wrath or appeasement, instead we find love and celebration, and that that we are those lost things and that God is the searcher and that when once we are found by that love, by that beauty, then then we get to participate in sharing that love and beauty to others. And this week, we're going to take a look at another story that's found in John's account of Jesus's life. Uh, it's in chapter eight. Um, now, this is a familiar story, so we want to well, want to challenge you to look at it with different eyes. Um, it's normally known as the woman caught in adultery, but I think a much better title for that is uh, Jesus and the murderous men. And you'll find out in just a second. And so in John chapter eight, we see this group of religious leaders. They, they bring a woman caught in adultery to Jesus. Um, but why? <laughs> why? Why would they do that? Well, if you look one chapter before in John seven, you'll see that all of these people are together. Um, they're at their Jesus is teaching among among the people during something called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's one of their biggest uh, religious uh, holidays or festivals. And the Pharisees aren't happy with this rogue rabbi. And they're actually trying to arrest him. And they're also trying to trick him. But Jesus outsmarts them um, at every turn. And they continue to lose face in front of all the people. And if you know anything about honor-shame cultures, uh, you'll know that, that there's almost no bigger sin than losing face. And so they walk away um, with these, with this ultimate insult, and so they they devise this idea. They they hatch this scheme where they're going to catch this woman uh, in adultery, and they're going to trap Jesus. And so, you know, they 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 are willing to restore their honor by any means necessary, even if that means murdering this woman. And so, I think that's why it's a better title, Jesus and the Murderous Men, because it's about them, and the story is not about her. Uh, but the members of the Sanhedrin which is this uh, local religious ruling body, think like a Supreme Court kind of thing, of which the Pharisees are part of, um, couldn't admit that Jesus was more knowledgeable about the Torah or the books of the law than they were. Um, and they felt that weight, that, that shame. Um, and they would do anything to retrieve that power, to retrieve that honor that they've lost. And they would do that even by twisting, even by twisting scripture to try to shame uh, Jesus. So, they bring this woman that's supposedly caught uh, in this uh, in, in adultery, right? So what better way to trap him than this? 
okay? This idea of sexuality or sexual sin kind of heightens the tension, right? Um, at a familial, tribal, and even a societal level, uh, the idea or the desire to maintain honor and avoid shame is often tied to control of a woman's sexuality. Um, I mean, the honor of a family or clan uh, would be um, would be at stake if a married woman was caught in adultery or if uh, a young woman was found to not be a virgin at marriage. And so we have this 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 tension that's in the air, this the supposed woman that's caught in adultery, she's brought to Jesus. Uh, the Pharisee had lost this battle uh, the day before, but they were definitely going to win it today. Um, and they were going to win that war. They were on a corner of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was going to get the full force of all of it, all of their knowledge, right? Um, and here it comes. Um, so anyway, uh, we see in John chapter 8, uh, with verses 4 and 5, Jesus was teaching in the, in the, the temple area. And this is what happens. Teacher, they said to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Now, right off the bat, this feels shady um, because how did they catch her? Like, how did they catch this woman in adultery? If she was really caught in the act, then where was her partner, right? Because it, it kind of takes two to tango, doesn't it? Um, and if they were experts of the law, they would have known that. Or they're just igno ignoring that because Leviticus 20 says that the that the partner, the man, if he's found guilty, he should be uh, stoned as well. Um, they The previous day, just the day before, the Pharisees um, accused the crowds of not knowing the law. Um, and now they're just like, they're, they're either forgetting it or um, they don't know it. I think um, the, the scenario that best fits this is that they are just completely ignoring it to get what they want. Um, that they don't care, and the end justifies the means, right? So imagine the setting. The woman, uh, they bring the woman before the crowds, uh, interrupt Jesus as he's teaching. Not only are the crowds, not only uh, are the crowds that, in the crowds just Jewish people, um, but they're also Roman authorities uh, looking over them. Around three sides of the temple, they were in the temple courts, around three sides of the temple, there was this covered walkway. Um, and at the northern end of the temple was this large military fort. And now the first century Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Roman guards would use that walkway to patrol the area. And they were brutal. Um, if, you're, if you're familiar with the, the Disney Plus show, Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, um, I, I know this is just a fictionalized version, and I, and I don't mean to, to compare this, but in my mind it helps me to picture who the Roman Empire was. But you see this really dark, evil um, um, empire that, that they just don't care about humanity. That they have a, a, a goal, they have an end in mind, and they will murder anybody in their way to, to get to that thing, right? And that's who these people were, and that's who was over that watching over this. Um, they had easy access to disperse and arrest, and they ruled on enforcing that by the most severe means uh, possible. So that's where we're at in this thing, okay? So what are the real options to this question that Jesus has? If he says yes, then according to the Torah, right, the law, then she's to be put to death. She's to be, she's to be killed by stoning. If, if, if that happens, there's going to be an uproar, uh, not only because um, by this point in time that really didn't happen, but also because it was against the law for anybody but Romans to uh, levy a death penalty and then to execute it. If Jesus tried to do that and they tried to murder her, then Jesus would be arrested on the spot and then brought up for trials of some sort of insurrectionist kind of law breaking. But if he said no, if he bowed to Roman authority and minimized the punishment, then he would have been accused of being weak and a coward, right? The Pharisees then would have had Jesus trapped fair and square. Look, he's not who he says he is. Um, but let's see what happens next, right? Um, but before we move on, like there's something that I think that we have to remember is that in the middle of all of this is still humanity. There is a woman caught in the middle of all of this drama. There's still someone here who is being treated as nothing just to prove a point. This woman whose life hangs in the balance is still just there waiting for this to play out. And then Jesus does something really odd. Look at verse 8. He says this, or it says this. Then he stooped down and wrote in the dust. 
Now, we can't move past this. Why would he stoop down? It says it right there. Duh, Joe. To write. Yes, yes. Okay, that's true. He does stoop down. But when he stooped down, when he does the stooping, when he goes down, whose level is he going to? Right, he's going to the woman's, right? Uh, he drops down to her level and in doing so identifies with her. This woman is being used as a pawn by all of these powerful religious leaders. Sound familiar? And they have completely ignored her humanity. But Jesus sees her, and we should too. Um, identifying with the marginalized or the othered isn't about taking selfies. It's not about riding in on our white horse with our savior complex. It's about entering into their world on their terms. It's about seeing the humanity, seeing the person, and being with them. Um, when my dad first started going to Haiti, um, if you don't know, uh, my parents have a medical mission in Port-au-Prince. Uh, when he first started going to Haiti, uh, it was a small island off the main island called Loganov. Um, and it was a dentist group that went. And um, there was this large missionary compound, and the missionaries very rarely left it. Um, uh, they hired locals to kind of do work around the place, but they, they never really went outside the compound. I, I guess they hosted other people coming in to do clinics and stuff. I'm not quite sure what they did. Um, but that didn't quite sit well with my dad. So he, he started, um, like when he would go down, he would go out into the village and he would hang out with people and he would bring supplies to people that need supplies. And there was a basketball hoop and there was a group of guys that played basketball. So he started playing basketball with them. And they realized that my dad saw them as people and they saw him as a person. And it's just people being people. As a matter of fact, they even started calling him Blanc du Trois which means white 23. And listen, I'm going to be honest here. My dad was a good ball player, okay? He really was. But this is the only scenario in which my dad can be compared to Michael Jordan. Sorry, Dad. Um, but the missionaries hated it. Now, I'm not sure if my dad decided to stop going because it was such an aggravation or they uh, stopped inviting him. Either way, it doesn't matter because it made them really mad and my dad didn't like that. So he went off and started his own thing, and now you know why I'm a butthead. It's my dad's fault. Uh, but my dad was doing the same thing that Jesus was, right? He was seeing them where they were and meeting them where they're at. And, and, and identifying with the marginalized doesn't have to be something that's grandiose or fancy. It doesn't have to be life-saving. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Identifying with the marginalized can start as simply as playing in a pickup basketball game. So back to the story. Right? Jesus stoops down. He writes in the dirt. Everyone gets caught up in what Jesus was writing. But have you ever asked the question why he started doing that in the first place? I mean, it's such a weird thing to do. But what they understood and what we miss uh, is that Jesus is showing them that not only does he know their Torah, the law, better than they do, but he also knows the Mishnah, which is the written account of all of the oral law that they had collected. So according to rabbinic Judaism... Uh, the oral law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai and was passed on by word and mouth throughout the generations. Okay? The, Pharisees, the Pharisees accepted the oral law along with the Torah as being equally inspired and equally uh, authoritative. Uh, so the Mishnah had collected all of the sayings uh, and provided rabbinic interpretations of those sayings. Um, and in responding to the Pharisees' question, he gets down on the ground and starts writing in the sand. And we can't forget that the context of this encounter, if you look, is during the Sabbath. Now, um, according to Mishnah, it is forbidden to write on the Sabbath except when it leaves no lasting mark. And this is what it says in Shabbat 12.5. If one writes with a liquid or with a fruit juice or in the dust of the road or with any substance that does not endure, he is exempt. Jesus completely catches the Pharisees off guard with his knowledge of the oral law as well as the written law. And it's just another like jab from Jesus to the Pharisees. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty strong flex we miss. But in a real twist of events here, okay, this is what happens. He completely throws everybody in the audience. John 8, verse 7. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Now, their own Jewish scriptures have clearly told them that they have all sinned, so they know 
that they're now trapped. What, what The trap that they had set has now ensnared them. And, the, and uh, my guess is that they're not sure what to do. And so the crowd is looking, um, as the cultural norms dictate, the crowd is looking to the, to the eldest Pharisee um, and member of the scribes to see um, what they're going to do. And whoever this person is, they have no choice. Um, they turn and walk away, and they're followed by others in descending order. And the Pharisees and scribes, they have completely lost another battle to Jesus. And so their fury intensifies, and their sense of shame deepens. Now, don't forget the woman, because as the crowds begin to disperse, the woman's remaining. Jesus writes a second time in the sand, and what does he write? We don't know. Only Jesus and this woman, and this is what it says in 10 and 11. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, uh, where are your accusers? Uh, didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus saves the woman from her accusers and from a certain certain and cruel death, right? Jesus fulfills the Torah, accepts the punishment of the Torah, but removes the penalty of Torah, right? Now, this story is not about Jesus condemning the woman or go and sin no more. That's always the focal point of this, as if um, there's something wrong with her. This idea of sin, something wrong with us. I am the bad thing. But that's not what their idea of sin was. Their idea of sin, you can uh, the word literally means to miss the mark, to stray from a path. And what Jesus is saying to her is like, there's no condemnation. He says that. I don't condemn you. Before he says anything else, there's no condemnation. Now, sister, let's get you back on the right path. Let's walk this life out together. Let me show you how to do this thing called life. The story is not about her. The story is about power abusing the weak. It is about religious power using the marginalized to maintain that power. It's about religious leaders twisting scriptures to keep the powerless in their place. And it's about Jesus confronting and shaming that power. Do you guys know what today, what, what also is today besides Father's Day? It's, um, it's Juneteenth. Growing up, um, I'd, I'd honestly never heard about this holiday. I didn't get taught about it in school. I remember seeing something on the calendars much later in life, um, but I didn't really know what Juneteenth was until up to just a few years ago. But it is the longest-running African-American holiday in our nation's history. It is the celebration of the actual freeing of all of the slaves. Um, in 1863, the, proc uh, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was, was signed into order. Um, Theoretically freeing all the slaves, it didn't quite do so. Um, it enslaved most of, of the enslaved people, um, but the westernmost Confederate state of Texas still had uh, uh, upwards um, more than a quarter million um, people in slavery. That was until on June 19th, 1865, two years later, uh, Major General Gordon Granger issued uh, General Order Number 3, which says this, uh, The people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with the proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised, now listen to this advice, this is a horrible advice. The freedmen are advised, you can take that advice and shove it, uh, to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. And while this order was essential to the freeing of more than a quarter of a million people that were still enslaved in Texas, the racist language used in those final sentences showed just how much more work needed to be done. But here's the thing. Here's why all of that is entangled together. We are still fighting the same battles that Jesus fought. It comes in many different forms and disguises, but at its root, it's the same fight. The story of the woman in John 8 is the same story of American slavery, is the same story of women's suffrage, is the same story of civil rights, is the same story of marriage equality, is the same story as the culture wars that we're fighting today. Power, often religious, bullying the weak, 
marginalizing the other. Jesus wouldn't have it then, and Jesus isn't having it now. So the thing for us that we have to walk through is, is not participating in systems that oppress or marginalize other people. Now, here's the thing. Jesus said that the truth would set us free, right? We believe that Jesus is truth. We believe that freedom isn't just a spiritual freedom. It is that, but it's not just that. It has to be a real tangible freedom that brings good fruit to everyone it touches. I'm going through, I'm reading a bunch of uh, uh, church history, American church history, and one of the greatest fallacies of the church in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s is that following Jesus is only about this inward transformation that we that if we're going to uh, address these issues, it has to be done on an interpersonal, like it has to be me, I ha- my, my heart has to be changed without addressing any of the systems that support <laughs> the oppression of people. And and I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at these stories of Jesus and looking at church history, American church history, and like, how do you, how do you see what Jesus did? The tables that he flipped and then arrive at the conclusion that following Jesus is nothing more than just a heart change. Like, I'm, yes, Lord, I, into my heart. Okay, my job's over. I don't get it. And so I think that the wisdom for us today is that Jesus identifies with the marginalized. That Jesus fights for the other and that Jesus creates a way when gatekeepers refuse to do so. And so what does that mean for us? What does that mean for you? Right? First, I want to talk to you if you've ever been othered or marginalized, whether it was by systems or you were made to feel that way by people. Like, I I hope that that, that you know that you were encouraged this morning that Jesus sees you, that he identifies with you, that he, he stoops down, gets to where you are, enters your world on your terms, and fights for you. Are you, guilt, are you being guilty of part of the system that oppresses? And confession time, that's me. I'm not going to put that on anybody else. I have. I have been a part of that. Mostly silently, sure. Yeah. Unknowingly, most of it, right? But I still did it. I was still in it. I still participated in it. I still benefited from those things. But shift, that's why I work so hard now. It's why I'm so vocal. This is my repentance. This space, shift, whatever this thing becomes, this is my day in and day out repentance until the day I die. Do you know what the word repentance actually means? In the Greek, it's the word metaneo. Metaneo is the word for Greek, all right? And it means to change one, one's mind and amend. It means to change your mind. It means to make a decision that you're going to stop doing what you were doing and then make it better. Do something different. Amend where you can and then work for better. And so if that's you, then we have to make the decision to undo what we can undo what we can, right? And then work for better. And so as we end and we gather for this kind of time of reflection, as you're watching this on the stream, um, we gather around that symbolic table of Jesus, right? Whether we're in person or we're far apart. And we're going to let those small little emblems remind us of the Messiah, right? That, That bread that stands for his body, that juice that stands for his blood, remind us of the Messiah that worked so hard against power, so hard against religious power that they killed him for it. Let it encourage us if we're the marginalized, that Jesus fights for us. He identifies with us. He creates ways around the gatekeepers or through the gatekeepers. He's flipping those tables for the other. But if we're the ones that have been part of the oppressing, right? a part of the othering. Then let it empower us to repent of our past, right? To undo what we can and then to work for better because it's Jesus. He's the one that died to bring all of that change, right? So let's pray. Creator God, we're thankful for another time together. We're thankful for technology and to be able to do this. Um, Lord, I pray that you would, well, I'm thankful for your stories. I'm thankful for your interaction. 
I'm thankful for how you responded when humans tried to manipulate uh, manipulate God's word to try to create something that's not actually there, to turn, to turn you into something that you're actually not. Lord, we're thankful that you identified with her, that you got down with her, that you stood in solidarity with her, that you protected her, Lord. We're thankful that you don't stand with the people that hold all the power, the people that hold all the keys. Lord, we're thankful that you are a shepherd, that you are the gate, you are the door. Lord, we're thankful that your love is so wide and so deep and unimaginable. Lord, we're thankful for the grace of your gospel for all of humanity. We're thankful for what you did on the cross so that you brought healing to all of humanity, not just a select few, but all of us. Lord, how amazing is that? And so, Lord, as we get ready to, uh, as we get ready to partake of this, uh, uh, of the separate home, and as we get ready to go back out into the world, Lord, I pray that we would do so bearing those good fruits, knowing that you're growing those good fruits in us, Lord. I pray that we don't hoard those, that we share, and that we impact our homes and our neighborhoods and our schools and our workplaces and our communities. And Lord, we're just so thankful for, um, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for your grace, your mercy. Um, God, you are so good. And Jesus, we love you. And uh, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Love you. Now go and love on some people.